Hi, this is Holly Kenny. You're watching iloveLimerick.com, and today I'm at the Castle Troy Park Hotel to talk about mental health with Brezzy. Oh yeah. So how are you doing? Good. All good. Good. How are good. You? So you would be one of the biggest mental health advocates for people of my generation. Did you have any mental health role models when you were growing up? No, that was a problem. Uh, as bad as the stigma is now, it didn't. It absolutely wasn't even muttered when I was that. Well, you're talking, I suppose, the nineties. Um, I think we've come an awful long way with the conversation. Uh, we haven't come a long way with access to help, but we've come a long way with, with the conversation in the 90s. Forget about it. Um, things I remember quite acutely, um, one of the, our heroes growing up would have been Kurt Cobain. And when he took, took his own life, I remember all of us in school asking the teachers, like, what happened? We didn't, understand, we didn't even understand what suicide was. And trying to ask them, and they were saying, you know, their, their response that he was a coward, that he was this and he was that. And that had a huge impact on a lot of people because they, you know, if the teachers were probably thinking properly, they'd go, These, this guy's a hero. Uh, if it was a professional athlete, it might have been a different situation. Because he was a rock star, it was kind of, it was seen differently. But yeah, no, there was no role models when I was growing up, unfortunately. Mm. So how do you think the conversation of mental health has evolved in both kind of like society and media um, since you were a teenager? Uh, it's dramatic. Yeah, it's it's dramatic for many different reasons. Media's evolved massively uh, since I was a teenager. Me media now is predominantly based around new media. Uh, the access to information is huge. I think the other aspect of it is what's happening with technology and media and everything. It the reality is nobody now is immune to it. Everybody is starting to struggle with their minds because they're con constantly bombarded with information. You know, they come home from work, they weld their face on an iPad, they watch some depressing soap, and then they watch, weld their face on an iPad again. And their default setting with that is stress, anxiety, lack of sleep. And you're noticing a lot of people. I think modern society really is, is like kryptonite for, for, for the mind. And I think we're noticing a lot, of more, a lot more people reporting issues of low-grade anxiety issues, uh, you know, depression, uh, and also things like uh, self-image issues, like uh, eating disorders, and stuff like that. I think we have to wake up and understand that the modern society is quite chaotic. And now it's about time that we actually change how we help people. We, we have to look at our education system. We have to be brave. We have a great education system if you're good at learning. If you can learn stuff and learn it off, you'll do okay and you'll go to college and you'll get into a degree that you probably don't want to do because everyone else told you it was a good degree to do. And you end up kicking yourself. And what has to happen now within our education system we have to highlight what is the passion of the young person, promote that passion, whether it's music, fashion, academia, sport. They should be allowed to go for their passion and that automatically will help them mentally. Mm. And then we've got to give them the coping strategies to actually deal with their passion and the, the, to deal with mental health issues. Because no matter what you do in life, you're going to come across them. Yeah. Studies have shown that physical and mental health are linked. Mm. And I mean, you've been very successful in rugby in the past. So how important is physical health in relation to your well-being? It's very important to point out that this is my well-being. Uh, I know people who've had very little benefit from physical exercise. Mm. I know in my there's been there's been parts of my in my past where I, I wouldn't have been able to walk around the garden. Uh, I'd be that low. I'd be that unwell. So they don't need people don't need to hear people go on, go out and take a run. The whole re recovery thing with mental health is the individual. It's subjective. You have to customise it yourself. No psychologist or no psychologist is going to give you the definitive answer. The issue being is that most people won't actually look for those those solutions because they're so petrified of the, the stigma. They're so petrified of admitting that there's something not right. And they're so petrified of seeking help. Because the reality is self help works. It does work. Mm -hmm. So for, in terms of exercise, for me personally, um, there was a fi there's a fine line between where exercise is helpful and where exercise becomes actually bad for you because you put yourself under pressure to do it all the time. Mm. You do your, put yourself, you miss a gym session, you get really you know angry with yourself, you get low, you get anxious. That's when it gets unhealthy and obsessive. So you got to be aware of what is healthy. For me, nature and exercise is what's healthy. You know, I don't like gyms. I dread going inside to a gym. Uh, I love going outdoors. I love going on my bike. I love going for a run. I love swimming in the lakes and that for me is the type of exercise that helps whereas in the past if I was really anxious or having an acute phase of anxiety I would take drugs whereas now I would go for a run.
It's mm. it's the way I deal with it, or I would meditate. You used to be a judge panel on The Voice, mm. and um, you watched young people kind of, you know, embracing their talents and trying to go for their dreams and stuff. So, in your musical experience, how did creating music and art help battle your demons mm. of depression and anxiety? Uh, I think it's weird, like with the with the band, with the Blizzards. Uh, you wouldn't. Our music is very. We try to actively make it as uplifting and as, I suppose, glass half full type of music, which everyone kind of says it's really, un, you know, unlike your history, you don't hear much of it coming across because I didn't want to because I wanted my the music that I played and played live to, have, to, to be an antidote for me, something else. But one big thing for me was playing an instrument. When I play an instrument, I'm just stuck there. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking about anything else. Whether it's piano, whether it's guitar, whether it's writing music, whether it's being in a studio, it's literally like a like a weird. You just go into this. You're present, which is the the holy grail of anybody with anybody. If you can be present, if you can actually in, in, embrace the moment and not worry about the past or the future, and that's a cliche thing to hear. But loads of people say they do it, but they don't. Ha- they don't know how to. They go, oh, "I'm very present." I say, "You don't even know what that means." Mm. You know, until you do things that you love and you're passionate about, that's when you truly understand. And there's something called flow state, which is a psychological kind of phenomenon that when you're in flow state, it's like the world's in slow motion. Everything's moving slowly. So if you have a passion, you might have found yourself in that position a few times where you're just completely in a moment, but you weren't aware of what it was. Be aware of it. And the more you're aware of it, the more you can make it happen. The hashtag it's okay to talk with the men kind of doing selfies Mm. and doing that signal. So it was kind of promoting uh, mental health for young men. So why do you feel young Irish men have issues expressing their feelings in regards to their mental health? Because masculinity is absolutely f- in Ireland. It's and across the world masculinity is absolutely completely skewed and uh, what defines a man now is just embarrassing really. It's um, like and I think the great, great thing about the feminist movement is that it's actually it's made a lot of lads step back and go, well, maybe we should have a little talk about what, you know, how we how we are. And I think the reality of men and masculinity, if you look at advertising, if you look at any film, the reality is men men's masculinity is defined by their sexual conquests, their economic wealth, their hardness. I don't know really know when that happened. Somewhere along the line that happened, and it kind of, it, it's not good. And I think Irish men... Uh, are changing. I definitely think they're changing a lot. My generation are, di- are totally different generation to maybe the generation above me, where we are embracing change, where we are understanding that, you know, no matter what people want in this Ireland, we're, we are liberal. We are moving to that liberal place. There's still a few conservative traditionalists around. Um, you know, that's their opinion. That's absolutely fine. We live in a democracy, but the actual shift in our culture is moving towards liberalism. And that's something that I'm hoping will help help men actually develop this conversation but we you know men are really moving and it, it, they stood up but you just have to look at the suicide rates and the reality is most men who unfortunately go go and and ultimately take their own life have never actually even looked for help and i do think the other side of it people say women are better at talking about their feelings i don't believe that either i think women will talk about surface stuff you know stuff right at the surface but you go anywhere below that the stuff that causes the damage They struggle with that as well. And I think that's just a social thing that we all have to look at. What do you think is the next step for advancing mental health in Ireland? Um, I'm very vocal about this. I think I have, I think we're past the awareness thing. I think the awareness thing is there. It's grand. Everyone's now talking. The media are engaging with it. It's on the radio, it's on TV, it's everywhere. We're doing interviews on it. We are now in the what are we going to do phase. Uh, There's families out there who can't get access for people who who are struggling mentally. There's people who are in acute distress, uh, who are suicidal, that that have no other option but to walk into an A&E on a Saturday night at three in the morning when there's drunk people covered in blood, vomiting. That's not a place for a distressed young person or or person in general who's suicidal or self-harming. We don't have the services to actually cater for, for the demand now. And that's what we got to look at. And that's not saying the HSC, like the HSC, the people that work in the HSC are brilliant. They're just not resourced. They're being put in dangerous environments with danger, in dangerous situations. You have clinical psychologists being asked to train for whatever, 10 years to tell a 14 year old teenage girl that they can't see her for, for three years. And often you never see that teenage girl again because she doesn't make it. These are the harsh realities of our mental health um, on the political level, on the system level. And that's where we're turning our attention. I'm turning my attention to because people don't need people like me going around going, it's great to talk. 
and then going, well, who do we talk to? Where do we go? Who do we have? Uh, what they need now is actually support systems. And there's brilliant supports out there too that people don't know about that need to be signposted to. There's your pay to house, you're aware, you've got your suicide or survive. They're doing these incredible programs. But the problem is, are they doing the government's work? That's what we've got to look at. Are they, they walk, run around trying to pick up the pieces that the government should, should be doing? Because we have a massive, massive tax rate here. And unfortunately, our taxes are being fecked into things that don't mean anything. And they're not being put into where we need to help people. And that's in our, our health system. And if you look at our health system, only 6% of the budget goes into mental health. That tells you that that's a symbolic figure of how we've treated mental health in Ireland. And I think that's the next move. And I think anybody who's listening or watching and ask me what to do, lobby go at people, anyone calls to your door, any politician, this has to be number one priority because it is. It's the biggest epidemic in our country. So thank you so much for your time, Brezzy, and thank you so much for you know delving into the issues of mental health. So this is Holly Kenny, you've been watching ilovelimerick.com and we hope to see you very soon.